turnout at 10.45 on a Saturday morning on a really nice day to hear about Gandhi, and I think perhaps that tells us something about how he is still quite relevant today and still commanding a lot of interest. Um, so I'm hoping we're going to have a little talk today. I'm going to ask both of these um, very interesting experts. We have some questions about Gandhi in this session called Letters from Gandhi, and then I will be looking for some questions from you, if possible. Um, so Letters from Gandhi is a title. Um, Gandhi wrote an enormous amount of letters. He wrote an enormous amount generally. Um, in fact, if you wish to approach the complete works of Mahatma Gandhi, I think you'll find, I think it's 102 volumes, 100 volumes, um, which are sort of roughly 1,000 pages each of very small print um, on onion skin paper. So, you know, we're going to start by just reading all of those out. Um, if you could just sit still... <laughs> Uh, to give you a full introduction, no, it's okay, it's fine. Um, but he did write letters all the time, and he, he wrote so prolifically. So, I mean, there are lots and lots of different subjects we could, um, different ways we could take this today. Um, we've already heard a little uh, from the ambassador about, um, about Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, uh, a man who was born in 1869 in Gujarat, studied law here in London at the Inner Temple, and really made his name in South Africa, where he began his campaigns um, for representation uh, within the British Empire. Um, he returned to India in 1915 um, and became particularly prominent around the 1920s and 1930s when he led his famous Salt March. Um, and the Indian independence struggle continued. Uh, that did not immediately result, of course, as we know, in independence. Um, and through other, other schemes like Quit India, we might hear more about all of these later, um, and finally, um, he was himself opposed to the partition of the subcontinent, but when independence was achieved, after, soon after that, he was, of course, assassinated in 1948, 70 years ago. Um, he is, um, as Mr. Patnick said, uh, Gandhi is a figure who perhaps, I think, has gone through lots of revisions. You know, he's somebody who, um, I think, in the West particularly, has been held up, actually, as a sort of flawless saint, partly as a result of initial American news coverage in the 1920s and 30s, partly, of course, as a result of the very famous movie um, by Richard Attenborough. Um, but actually, at the time, he was quite extensively criticised and controversial. Um, and I think some of that perhaps is being rediscovered today, some of the controversies about Gandhi. So, you know, we can, we can go into all of this. Um, I want to introduce briefly the two panellists. Um, Tradeep Sarud here uh, works on the life and thought of Gandhi, as well as the intellectual and cultural history of modern Gujarat, which is the state, of course, Gandhi came from. Uh, he was formerly director of the Sabarmati Ashram, uh, where he was responsible for the setting up of the Gandhi archives, um, and he is now, I think, at Sept in Ahmedabad, is that right? And, um, and is publishing lots of works on Gandhi, which I think we will speak about soon, recently published a critical edition of the autobiography. Faisal Devji is reader in Indian history at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, uh, works on Indian political thought and that of modern Islam. Uh, his most recent book is Muslim Zion, Pakistan as a Political Idea, um, but he's also written, I've got it right here, re definitely recommend, very fascinating study of Gandhi's political thought called The Impossible Indian, Gandhi and the Temptation of Violence. Um, so perhaps we could start by talking a little about uh, Gandhi's autobiography, um, it's, uh, it's actually subtitled The Story of My Experiments with Truth. Uh, it was initially published in installments between 1925 and 1929, uh, mostly in his magazine. Um, so it actually only goes up to 1921 in his life, which is, you know, not necessarily the period many people are familiar with. Um, Tridip, you've just published this edition of that, and it, it's a fascinating book, but it's, it's an unusual book, isn't it? It's a very unusual book. I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's an unusual book in various ways. Um, autobiography is not an Indian mode of self-reflection. It's something that comes to us uh, around the mid-19th, late 19th century. Uh, Gujarati, in, in the language in which he wrote, uh, it's not a language which lends itself to talking about the self in the way Gandhi does, because uh, the language uh, of self and self-reflection uh, before 19th century was largely Sanskrit. Uh, when you, and and, and, and uh, that mode of self-reflection necessarily had a reference to the divine. So if you needed to speak about the self in the modern way, in which an autobiographical mode necessarily is, um, how do you go about it? So I think the first thing that Gandhi needs to do, as it, he does with Hind Swaraj also, is to create a new universe of language, mm -hmm. new references that old words have. Uh, do you speak about maker 
in a way that does not refer to maker with an M capital? How do you go about going? So the first is a large linguistic uh, <coughs> creativity that Gandhi brings into the act of writing the autobiography. That's one. Two, how do you actually distinguish between two modes that Gandhi speaks about? One, which is called experiment. And if it's an experiment, that's something that all of us can do, verify, participate. And something that he says emerges within the soul and subsides within the soul. Now, the autobiography, therefore, has to move at these two levels, speaking about something which all of us can verify, participate, do on our own, and something that's available only to him. Now, that part which is available only to him is the problematic part for a lot of us. How do you actually go about entering that universe? So for a reader uh, of the autobiography, the experiment is not the problem because uh, we understand the experimental method. We have all grown up with the experimental method. But it's, it's that part where Gandhi says, this is available only to me and my maker. That's where our problems, or problems that Faisal and I would have, begin as to how do you enter that text. Third problem is that it's written like it's serialized. Mm -hmm. It was never intended to be, it was never published as a book in the first instance. So there are things that are happening. People are responding to him. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a text which gets formed in conversation with people. Now, if you were to go to the archives of the Sabarmati Ashram, you realize that there are people writing to him on a, on a, on a regular basis, demanding that he write about such things. For example, the Psychoanalytical Society of Calcutta wrote long letters to him where the idea was that he should now start thinking about himself not in the Freudian terms. Now, is the autobiography being constructed through these conversations? So for a scholar of the autobiography and a reader of the autobiography, I think it's important to realize three things. One, um, that it's in Gujarati. And Mahadev's translation, beautiful as it is, uh, does capture some things. But it adds, as all translations do, it removes. But the cadence of that kind of Gujarati does not come through because English language has the autobiographical mode available while the Gujarati did not. Two, um, it's a work which gets created in conversation. And three, there are parts which are completely unavailable to us. So I think that's what makes that a fascinating text. Such an unusual book and as you say, created in conversation so that the idea of letters is very relevant here, isn't it, Faisal? Do you think this sort of, you know, almost kind of, um, epistolary mode of writing did have an effect? I mean, do you think his opinions did change as he wrote that book? Well, as uh, Trinidad was saying, uh, you know, as these installments are appearing mm. in the journal, in Gandhi's journal, he's receiving letters from interlocutors, some of whom say in South Africa he knew him there, disagreeing often with him, saying, no, no, you've got this wrong. And then he corrects or he refutes publicly. Mm. So the autobiography itself, not only is it called an experiment with truth, but it is written as an experiment with self-correction uh, and with refutation, uh, uh, you know, as it's being produced, and it's a, it's a it's kind of a remarkable way in which the term experiment, which you would think is a modern European term, is made a part of, as it was a telling of not just one's own story, but the story of truth itself. Because in a way, I would argue that it's not Gandhi who is the subject; it is truth that is the subject of his autobiography. As Sridip, you know, has said in his wonderfully annotated uh, 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 edition of the autobiography that's come out recently, uh, Gandhi is very uncomfortable when he's asked to write an autobiography. Uh, and he says precisely what Sridip has just said. You know, this is not something we do. Indians don't do this. Uh, it could be construed as being self-regarding and narcissistic. Uh, and after all, what do I have to tell people that is so special? And so in one way, uh, again, Sridip has said this, the autobiography is meant to be the story not of a singular genius, but a kind of example for everyone. And he says over and over again, look, even a child should be able to understand this, can understand this. This is meant for everybody. My experiences are, in a way, not mine. Uh, they could be anybody's experiences. Uh, but more than that, the experiences, in a way, uh, come out of a truth that is not subjective at all. So if I'm correct, you know, 
the, the, the English title, The Story of My Experiments at Truth, in Gujarati Satya Na Prayogo, in which Satya could possibly be the subject. Yeah. You know, so it's not I who am speaking, it is truth that is speaking through me. But I have no control over it, which is why in the autobiography, Gandhi, at many places, we, you know, he will recount some incident and says, now, who knows why I did this? Was I actually doing this because I, wa I was ambitious and I really wanted my fame to spread in the world? Or was I really concerned with the plight and poverty of the people I was engaging with? Who can tell? So there's a fundamental doubt at the center of it. Because after all, though truth speaks to, through him, he does not necessarily know uh, 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 it intimately. Uh, so there's something. It's an autobiography that's not really open to experiment and is multi-authored in that sense. It's, it's authored with all his interlocutors, but also he himself doesn't have complete access to it because it is truth that is speaking. And that is something we all might have some interpretations of, but we can never claim authoritative knowledge over it. And what, of course, is also interesting, again, to end with what Pradeep was saying, the element of the incommunicable is crucial for Gandhi. There are certain things, as he says, that only I know and my maker knows. Um, and those things cannot be said. I might not even be able to say them. So the autobiography is, in a way, not a communication. It is a, as if a display. It's an experiment as if it were a form of display. Here is an account. Here is a narrative. How will it strike you? What might it change in you? Um, uh, it is not me talking to you. It is truth talking through me. Let me just um, add mm. so, to what, what Faisal said. I think it's also important to understand the way the autobiography is written. Um, we think that Gandhi lived in his ashrams. Actually, he didn't. Um, he created this community, and he escaped them. And, and um, so of the 13 years that he was supposed to have stayed at Sabarimati Ashram, he actually lived there only for 1,520 nights. <laughs> exactly. Of which, 685 days are when he's writing the autobiography. So the ashram as an institution, as a community, is necessary for him to indwell. So there is a process of indwelling that's happening while he is writing the autobiography. He actually said, I'm taking a sabbatical. He wrote an essay saying, I'm taking a sabbatical. I will not move after Ahmedabad. And he realized the mistake. The ashram, Ahmedabad is a large town and would make demands. Next week, he corrected himself. I will not step out of the ashram. For, for the duration for which he writes the autobiography, he does not step out even into the city of Ahmedabad. So there is certain kind of indwelling that's required. Secondly, um, at various points in the autobiography, he tells you, I don't know why am I doing this. Yeah? Um, I don't have, I mean, never had any papers before him, no notes, no diaries. He would write and then said, I wanted to write about this, but I have ended up writing about this because this is the, the one dwelling within me asking me to do so. So at various points, he gives up even the authorship say, I am now only becoming a medium, a vehicle through which these things are coming out. It's the, it's the one who lives within me is dictating me to do so. So it's a very complex process by which this, this is happening. And yet also, I mean, both of you have said, I absolutely agree, that you know, it's this kind of you know, externalised document. But at the same time, it is extremely personal, isn't it? I mean, some of the stories he tells about his life are very intimate. And again, you say that might well be something that doesn't necessarily have so much of an Indian tradition. It's quite confessional. I can see why the Freudians got interested in him, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. You know. Absolutely, absolutely. Because, um, you know, if, if you look at um, the three autobiographies, well, the, the autobiographical tradition in India really begins with uh, not just the British presence, but something that we call the reform movement. So therefore, the idea was that you started writing about your life only as somebody who went through a process of change, of an external change, both within your person as also the community and the society that you lived in. So all 19th century autobiographies in every Indian language starts by saying, there is no, no life that I need to speak about. And then they go on to speak about four volumes, mm -hmm. uh, 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 the general length of an autobiography that you write. Uh, uh, and one thing that you would always say, I am doing this to modernize my language. So the autobiographical act was a quintessential modern act. Mm -hmm. Gandhi does not, 
have any such aspirations to modernize Gujarati. He does it through other things. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he plays around with Gujarati in, in a very, very uh, deep kind of a way, but through other, other texts. What's happening uh, uh, about the personal is that Gandhi, what we need to understand, has a very different sense of what constitutes personal, private, and something which is incommunicable. What is incommunicable, we will not even touch. Right? But the relationship between the, what, the modern relationship between the personal and the private uh, is interestingly played out for Gandhi. For example, the body is neither personal nor private. So, uh, I mean, if you were a good friend of Gandhi and you went to see him, uh, his sign of affection would be to give you an enema. <laughs> Right? I mean, I mean, every ashramite um, uh, was subjected to it. Now, is, is that bodily function personal, private? So body is neither personal nor private. Uh, sexuality certainly is not in, in his case. Uh, um, relations with uh, sons are not, because they are discussed and debated in the public domain. What is deeply personal is this quest for truth. Mm. What is deeply private is the way in which he is guided and moved by truth. Apart from that, nothing else remains within the what you would today call either the personal domain or the private domain. Body, food, relationships, institutions, and family, none of which remain within the personal domain or the private domain. And therefore, if you look at that house, it's a remarkable house. It can be approached by any, from any side. Yeah. The house in which he lived can actually be approached. It's, it's the only house that we know in modern Gujarat, uh, which has uh, two courtyards. Mm. And, and there is no rear and there is no front. So that tells you something about the relationship between the, the self, the space that you occupy. But I think uh, apart from this quest for truth and um, brahmacharya celibacy, Nothing is private. Mm. I think that leads interestingly into actually one of the ideas in your book, Faisal, which is you know about. I think you know in the West as well, it tends to be assumed. For instance, I think a lot of people would say that Gandhi was a great humanitarian, and that's an idea that actually you put down in this book. You say he actually wasn't that because his relationship with you know protests and so on is much more about duties than rights about human behavior is kind of more he's more interested in your duties and responsibilities than in human rights or humanitarianism could you perhaps talk a little about that and how that perhaps related to the way he lived his life yeah you know Gandhi's very interesting on this because you know we figure him today and indeed this happened even in his own time as a pacifist he wasn't a pacifist mm. as a humanist he wasn't really humanist as a humanitarian he used that word, but not in the way that we use it. Uh, and he was against all these things for many, many good reasons. Uh, he was against the idea, even in Swaraj, he refused to speak for humanity or in the name of humanity. He considered this an act of imperial hubris. This is, it's empires and imperial thinking that have this hubris of, the, you know, this willingness, this pretense of being able to speak for and to the entire human race. He thought that was deeply violent. Uh, against this, he counterposed, if you will, an ethics or a politics of invitation. So there's a kind of display, a self-display, uh, which invites people to engage. Uh, there is no wish to speak for. But he's critical of the idea of humanity for other more philosophical reasons as well. He thinks that the idea of humanity, no matter how expansive it is, actually is fundamentally based on the violence inherent in ideas of likeness, of similarity and similitude, of likeness of kin and of kind. So it actually is simply an expansion of something very narrow, which is to say, me and my friends, me and my family, me and my caste, me and my community. Those things are based on exclusions and violence. And humanity is simply all those things writ large, because it's, it's based on these ideas of similarities. When he uses the word humanitarian, he uses it for things that go beyond the human. For instance, cow protection, mm. right? So he'll say, the thing about the protection of cows is that it's truly humanitarian because in this move, you go beyond the human race. And you're protecting a being which is not equal to you, 
but with which you have no similarity or similitude, yeah. no kin or kind, mm -hmm. and which you, with which you cannot even communicate. And you know in Western philosophy from Aristotle uh, uh, onwards, speech is held to be an essential element of the human. Gandhi even rejects that. Mm -hmm. Precisely because the cow has no speech, you cannot actually speak to her. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have a duty towards her. You know? And this going beyond the species, by recognizing the violence inherent, even this expansive idea of humanity is extraordinary. To get to the question of rights, very briefly, uh, you know when uh, Julian Huxley, I, I say this in my book, uh, who was then uh, the director of UNESCO and was in the process of drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the 40s, he writes to Gandhi, among other people, Einstein, etc., and Gandhi writes back from a train somewhere and says, I'm not really interested in rights. Uh, because you know you think that rights are inalienable and fundamental, but in fact, rights are the most alienable of things. Rights are constructed by states and given to individuals. The one thing that is not inalienable is a duty. A duty belongs, no one can take away your duty. A duty belongs only to you. Not in the sense of property, you know. You recognize it for what it is. So a moral life can only be truly autonomous if it starts from duty, because duties are forever yours. Uh, whereas rights can be taken away, and rights are also problematic in, 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 in other ways. Uh, that the, when you claim a right, you sometimes implicitly deny the rights of others. A duty doesn't work in that same, uh, through that logic. And Tradeep, to bring this back to, I know that you're currently working on this kind of, you know, one of Gandhi's early campaigns in Champaran, um, which you know, was kind of his big, first big Satyagraha campaign in India uh, in 1917. And these were, this was to do with, I mean, you can tell the story, but it's to do with indigo farmers, isn't it? Can yes. we perhaps talk a bit about how this notion of duty informs that campaign and, and how that proceeded? You know, I think, um, the, the, and, 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 and Faisal says that in the book, uh, the fundamental duty that you have is to truth. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, truth can also be empirical truth. So what happens in Champaran and what I think, uh, what's seen as a Satyagraha is actually not a Satyagraha. Mm -hmm. It's actually an inquiry. Inquiry which is done by lawyers. All of them trained with the exception of two next door mm -hmm. um, in London. Okay? Uh, and they go and meet the peasantry, from the available records, we now know that 7,000 peasants were spoken to, their legal testimonies were taken down, their thumbprints or signatures were taken, which showed the entire political economy of land, of indigo, the, the, the usury that was practiced by indigo uh, industry, uh, by the kind of strange uh, landowning pattern which had begun to develop in, in, in parts of uh, India where the company owned certain large tracts of land but also leased out lands from other people and the tenant farmer is squeezed by both. What happens is, except for one little skirmish that he has with the collector, for which the collector is wrapped on the knuckles by the governor saying, you, you, you don't do these things, Gandhi does not get into a conflict with the British. What he does is that he presents this entire set of legally verifiable signed documents to the Agrarian Inquiry Commission, which then does away with this practice of one third of your land forcibly being given for cultivation of indigo. And that's the system that goes. That's the pattern that would be followed in each major satyagraha. We forget that every satyagraha required verifiable truth. When um, the Ahmedabad mill strike, of which also we are celebrating 100 years, uh, and no celebrations have taken place, uh, but that's, you know, we, we must remember, is the first major labor strike in modern India. What does he do? 60,000 families are engaged in textile trade or, 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 or textile industry. A survey is conducted of all 60,000 households. And that's what is really is presented as an evidence. Kheda Satyagra, again, data is collected about land holding patterns. So the element of the duty to truth, the fundamental duty, actually informs 
all of Gandhi's satyagras, including the salt march. We know that before he entered every village, there was a team of researchers which would have visited that village, would have collected all the data, including the data on, on, on cattle, because cattle also need salt, and you know you calculate the kind of salt says that each village plays. So before he entered a village, he had data about each village, our route. The point really is that whether it's Champaran, whether it's Kheda, whether it's salt, I think what we need to understand, the technique of Satyagra succeeds also because it's based on solid, irrefutable data. And that part of Gandhi's technique, that part of Gandhi's method, we don't really pay attention to. We have this idea that here is this man, charismatically walks into a village, and the village is transformed. It does not happen that way. Uh, also, what we don't realize, it's only when you do micro studies of each of these things, is that there is rejection. Gandhi faces rejection in village after village on certain issues. On other issues, he does not. So for example, on question of paying land revenue, the farmers would be with him. On the question of caste, they are not. So while he is celebrated as somebody who liberates you on the question of land revenue, but he is kept outside the village, and that hut will be burnt after Gandhi leaves that village. Mm. And that's a pattern that will repeat itself all his life. Mm. So there is, so I, I think, you know, so this duty is fundamentally to truth, but it also leads to a kind of a technique. Yeah. Um, perhaps we can bring that into talking a bit about nonviolence, Faisal, because your book is obviously subtitled The Temptations of Violence. Um, and nonviolence is sort of, it's one of those ideas, isn't it, that sounds obviously quite wonderful when you say it, but actually itself results in really a great deal of violence and a great deal of laying down of life and physical bodies, which, as you rightly pointed out, is something that Gandhi didn't consider necessarily to be your private property. Um, could you perhaps tell us a little about that? Yeah, I mean, I, if I'm correct, Gandhi thought that the only reason, or one of the fundamental reasons uh, that allowed for the conversion of violence into nonviolence was if they were, in fact, connected already. They had to be connected. Right? And he gave many kinds of examples of this. I'll offer you one. This is an example taken from the Great War of the Mahabharata, the great Indian epic equivalent to the Iliad, which is a story of a war between cousins between, in the same family, a civil war, let's say. And the evil prince, Duryodhana, army, uh, has some good people in it. Uh, and it has some bad people in it. And Gandhi says, look, though it's, they are in the wrong, yet they too are based without, whether they like it or not, they too are founded upon virtue. How is that? Because no army can hold together without virtues such as loyalty, bravery, friendship, promises made. So even if Duryodhana is perfectly evil, he cannot count upon the loyalty of his own army without presuming the virtue inherent in it. People fight because they are friends with others. Uh, a soldier will defend a fellow soldier because he knows him. Uh, you know, people risk their lives not simply for money or for victory, but for, because of these everyday virtues. And so the point then is, how do you convert evil to goodness by actually laying claim to those virtues and withdrawing? And if you withdraw them, evil collapses, because evil too is founded upon goodness, upon virtue. So in that way, violence and nonviolence are connected. It's not accidental that nonviolence is a negative concept, and Gandhi traded in negative concepts all the time. Non-cooperation is one. Non-violence in Sanskrit, also ahimsa, is also a negative word. He doesn't like too many positive uh, terms. You know? And the negative word here refers, I think, at least in part, to the fact that it is connected. The positive term is violence. And he says it clearly. Violence exists. Non-violence does not exist. But Nonviolence would be the only truth. It's the only thing that can, in fact, exist. Yet it comes together with violence. So the, the, the point is, how do you actually shift from one to the other? Now, the interesting thing uh, which Gandhi, to my knowledge, does not address is he talks a lot about throughout his career on how you shift from violence to nonviolence. The reverse shift he rarely talks about. Mm. 
you know, how is it possible to move from nonviolence to violence? Because technically, his reasoning allows for that as well. So perhaps it's an infinite task. The, the task of virtue and of morality is infinite. It never ends. And, it, and this, I think, also tells you why Gandhi was not a fan of history. He didn't like the idea of history. There's no teleological uh, move, you know, that you, there's only a one-way move. You know, that's it. You move from violence to nonviolence, and then you live happily ever after. It is an infinite task. You must constantly return to it. That is how you live, and that is what virtue means. Do you think nonviolence was, to what extent was it a successful strategy? Well, I, I think Gandhi thinks that it, uh, it's not a question of successful strategy so much because he thinks it's inherent in all human relationships that the world and society as we know it exists because of nonviolence. That we tend to think that our societies exist because of laws and armies and policemen, but those are really not sufficient. You know, uh, in fact, it exists because of nonviolence in the form of love or affection or friendship or mercy or compassion or what pity or whatever you have. Um, and that these other things, armies and policemen and laws, uh, you know, as it were, buttress the edges of it, and that's about it. So he's, in referring to, in, in thinking that we can actually make nonviolence into something crucial for our lives and societies, he's not trying to invent something that doesn't exist. He's drawing upon something that exists for each and every one of us. After all, families hold together. Friendships don't always break. Families can also split apart. Uh, but in fact, they tend to hold together. They might do so unequally. They might even have violence within them. But that's where the purification is needed. But you cannot deny these virtues that, as I pointed out, are even true of the evil Prince Duryodhana's own army, uh, where you know, if, you are not, if you cannot rely upon your soldier to sacrifice himself for you, for whatever reason, it might not be because they like Duryodhana, it might be because they are loyal to their fellow soldiers, then nothing is possible. Uh, so it, virtue lies at the, it's absolutely central which is why he's, if you will, a, an optimistic thinker. He's not a pessimist. I know, I'm know. i conscious that I want to have some questions from the audience, but I do have one more sort of perhaps rather controversial subject particularly that I want to talk about because I know that Tridip is also working on the diaries of Manu Gandhi, um, Gandhi's grandniece, and you've already mentioned the Brahmacharya experiments. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's sort of got a lot of attention over the last few years, I think, this particular aspect of Gandhi's life. It is controversial. Um, you know, later in his life, he effectively, if I'm being fair, tested his vow of chastity. Um, and one of the ways he tested that was to sleep in a bed with a very young girl. Um, now, he was 78, she was 18. Um, and this was something that had a lot of negative pushback from many of his followers at the time. And, you know, it was, it's not kind of a modern back projection to say that this might be a little bit questionable. In fact, lots of people at the time found this very questionable. Um, in the wake of the sort of Me Too movement, and you know, and we're now sort of talking about this, Tradeep, how can we approach this as scholars? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with it. I'm struggling with it deeply. Um, um, what we know is that this was not the first time that such an experiment took place. Uh, the, the, these what you would call experiments with celibacy had taken place in Gandhi's life. Uh, to his credit, he always wrote about them, uh, uh, not only privately and through letters, but through, through publicly. Uh, now, various questions arise. What is the nature of consent? What is this informed consent? What is the nature of power relationship uh, with, with Gandhi? Is, are these people women who participate in this experiment is equals? The answer is no. Is there a tremendous exercise of power that Gandhi has as both the head of the ashram community and otherwise he does? Mm -hmm. uh, so what I try and do uh, is that what I've decided to do is that these diaries which have never been seen before, uh, uh, which, uh, which are not only about the Brahmacharya experiment, they are much larger sets of things. The most interesting thing the, about these diaries is that it, these are authenticated in the sense that each day's entry that Manu would write, it would be read to Gandhi or Gandhi would read it, sometimes make corrections of grammar or fact and sign that each day. So these are diaries that in some ways are co-authored and therefore very important. Uh, the, 
But that's also quite controlling of him, isn't it? Absolutely, I mean, it is. It is. It's absolutely, voice. absolutely, right? I mean, and so uh, it has to be read out to her, mm. uh, to him every day, or, or left by his bedside, and he, and and he would he would sign that. Uh, what I have decided to do is uh, to present the diaries as they are. In the sense, I am not going to exercise any editorial rights whatsoever. Uh, every mark in the diary is going to be marked both in the, in the Gujarati edition and the English edition. So I'm trying to do a bilingual, I mean, or, or two, two editions almost simultaneously. So if somebody wanted to, 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 to check whether the originals uh, and, and, and the translations, how do, how, uh, uh, what is the relationship that could be done. What also, the other thing that I'm trying to do uh, um, is write a long introduction in which uh, the nature of the experiment, Gandhi's reasons thereof, and the responses that came from the ashramic community and others are all enumerated. Mm -hmm. And then um, I present my case as an editor. Uh, is this something that I understand? I don't. Uh, is this something that I find defensible? I don't. Uh, uh, and it's not just because Manu is a granddaughter. No. Uh, even if it were Kasturba, it would be indefensible if she were not a willing partner in the exercise, moved by a same desire. I think what we need to understand is that uh, even if they are giving consent, and, and there is informed consent in some cases, not probably not uh, not in every instance but there is in in some cases but are they actually moved by the same desire to test their own chastity mm. the answer is no they are they in each of these cases these are subjects upon which experiment does take place objectionable yes and i think the term that would hurt gandhi most and that's the term that i'm going to use is not objectionable not but it's adharmic. Mm. It violates every code of morality, of virtue, of religion, and I think also of truth. Mm. And that's what I am going to do when those diaries uh, come out. And that's really what I, uh, uh, I, I hope I have the courage to do it. But I wow, I, I can't wait to read them. That sounds like a fascinating approach. Um, I'm going to open it now to some questions, hopefully. from uh, uh, We've got a gentleman with a microphone, so if you could this gentleman over here, if you could just come over here, this side, if someone's got a mic. Have you, yeah, this la lady, could you bring it to this gentleman here in the red top? <coughs> Regarding uh, Gandhi's secularism. Can you speak right into the microphone, sorry. Hello. Yes, perfect. Re regarding Ga Gandhi's secularism, Jinnah had mentioned that Gandhi's secularism is, sha is sham. In, in fact, he's propagating Hindu philosophy. In this connection, I will uh, mention about the cow protection. So cow prote why did he took up cow protection instead of a dog protection? Is it connected with his Hindu philosophy? Can we ask this question? Um, let's start with Faisal on that. Why, why cow protection and not dog protection? Well, I think Gandhi always started with uh, what existed, right? So he didn't, as I was saying earlier, he didn't invent things. Uh, you have to start with what already is there. And cow protection and disputes over cow protection were, of course, very important in Gandhi's own day, as they are now again in India. Uh, they were the cause of violence um, and sometimes of riots, and Gandhi felt he had to address them. He couldn't avoid them. And in a way, I think one of the things he was trying to do was to see how these issues could be, as it were, converted themselves. Uh, what was the truth in these issues? I don't mean the factual truth uh, of you know, good moti motives or bad, but what might be just in the way that he thought that Duryodhana's army also contained virtue while he didn't like it, right? So he thought these issues, which are often grounds for dispute and dissension and even violence, could be converted or purified. And they needed to be addressed in this manner. You couldn't simply address them. They had to be addressed socially, not simply by law. Because clearly, the force of law was not working. The laws existed in terms of violence and, and loot and rapine and murder and riot. They didn't work. Uh, 
you had to address these issues in another way. So what is the truth in cow slaughter, in cow protection, I should say? There are many ways in which he does this. It's actually quite fascinating. We don't have time to go on. But to, to, uh, you know, he doesn't stop with cows, I have to say. Dogs are actually quite important for Gandhi. Right? He's constantly going on about the killing of dogs. And snakes. And snakes. Should they be killed? Shouldn't they? There's, a, there's huge debates in the ashram. And a number of his ashrams, both in South Africa and in India, were overrun with snakes. You know? So you know, he still can't get rid of the fear of snakes, of serpents, as he puts it. So how are you to actually deal with it? When does it become legitimate to kill a snake or a dog? Uh, what about rabbit dogs? So these questions are by no means restricted to cows, though of course the cow protection issue becomes, because it's such a major issue politically, uh, takes center stage. But he is, is entirely impartial, if I will. Now cow protection draws his attention because he thinks that there is a religious element in it. Uh, and what I said about it earlier, you know, that you know, how can you think about cow protection in terms of going beyond the human race itself? Uh, and is that something that you can draw from that issue? And if so, how might you make what is an, a subject of dispute between primarily Hindus and Muslims, though not only Hindus and Muslims, into a subject of, uh, that unifies them? And one place in which this happens is during the Khilafat movement, uh, you know, immediately after the First World War, when the Ottoman Empire is defeated, by the allies, and Indian Muslims come out in support of the Sultan, of the Caliph, who is seen as a Muslim head. They invite the great Muslim prelates of India, invite Gandhi to be the leader of the Khilafat movement. This is the first pan-Islamic movement, and only, it's the biggest one in history, which is led by a Hindu. It's important to note, officially led by a Hindu. All the ulama offered this Absolutely. leadership to Gandhi. He led it, and he stopped it. Right? When, it, when, it, when it broke out into violence. So during the Khilafah movement, this is when the issue of card protection also becomes important. And Gandhi says very interesting things. The, the, the Hindu leaders and the Muslim leaders come to him and say, look, the Muslim leaders say, if you support the Khilafah movement of the Caliphate, we will abjure cow slaughter. And the Hindu leaders say to him, if you get the Muslims to abjure cow slaughter, then we will support the Khilafah movement. And Gandhi says, on no account, this is not a contract. This is not a deal. All right? A nation is not built on a contract which is a temporary thing, right? which is based on interest. <laughs> a nation is built upon real, what he calls, heart unity and mutual sacrifice. If we offer friendship and support, and if we Hindus offer friendship and support to Muslims and they see uh, uh, that they have gained by it, then they will automatically um, or voluntarily um, uh, refuse cow slaughter. And the reverse is true as well. And he often compares cows. The cow is like the caliph, right? Yeah. <laughs> For instance. So, or the cow is like the credo. So there's no, uh, it's pre the cow is compared to things which are precisely not like it in the everyday world. So he moves away from this relationship of similarity and similitude. So there, there are ways in which these, these major issues are worked on by Gandhi and purified uh, so that he can find what is true about them and make that truth available to everyone. It's not purely a Hindu issue. And also, I think, Faisal, but the most controversial, among the most con controversial yeah. things that he did was to actually kill a cow at the ashram in 1928. Uh, the entire debate about, and, and he says, this is an act of nonviolence. Mm. Right? Uh, it's a terminally ill calf, and what do you do? Do you, do you allow it to go on, or do you actually take its life? with a prayer, and he decides to do that. So I, th I don't think these, these um, with Gandhi, even the question of cow is simple. Right? I mean, he, he does think that in certain instances, if you belabor the cow in a certain way, it's better to kill it, rather than treat it, uh, as you said, with complete lack of humanity. Right, other questions? This gentleman over here, please. Um, if you could, where's the microphone gone? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, hello. Uh, oh, my you, question, rather my curiosity, is Could that... Could you speak directly uh, into the top of the microphone, if possible? Okay. My question, or rather my curiosity, is did uh, Mahatma uh, 
you know, most of his uh, life was during the early part of 20th century. Did he lack or did he have any conflict with scientific outlook, which is, which is so prevalent at that time? Uh, not really, none whatsoever. Uh, um, um, his self-image was that of a scientist. That's why he calls it an experiment. Uh, uh, he, uh, he thought of himself as a doctor, as a healer and a doctor. Uh, uh, he liked to play with objects, uh, including a microscope. Uh, um, uh, one of the very, very rare images that we know of, uh, of Gandhi is uh, he actually owned a microscope to examine all kinds of germs. Uh, so his relationship to big science is of a different kind, but science is uh, is not, uh, and the scientific temperament, scientific method, of course he changed it around. Uh, uh, so he does not have the, I mean it's not a simplistic relationship that Gandhi rejects big science, big technology, and he tells you to do charkha. No, it's not that. Uh, so Gandhi's uh, mode is, he is in fact in the autobiography says, I have searched myself through and through as a scientist would. And that's how he begins uh, the introduction to the autobiography. So, uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating relationship that he has. His understanding of the medical sciences is much better than other things because it's a lifelong quest that he has. His understanding of design or as fabrication of things is of a very superior order. Uh, he's constantly working with his hands. Uh, he knew how to design buildings, for example, so he knew about structures and load bearing structures uh, because the entire ashram, uh, both at Phoenix and at Sabarmati, is actually something both designed and built by him. He knew how to work leather uh, and he knew how to work cloth. Uh, so I think the relationship to technology and to scientific science as a method uh, is, is, is fascinating. Uh, and there is no rejection of either. There are questions on both. But there's no rejection. Faisal, on science? No, I don't think I have. You know, in a way, we sometimes confuse Nehru's um, advocacy of what he calls the scientific temperament, mm. which then comes to define what we call Nehruvian secularism with Gandhi. And Gandhi is quite different in that respect. Uh, whereas Nehru is talking about big science, mm. uh, you know, very often. And Gandhi's, as is his wont, talking about apparently very small things. But it's only from small things that big things come, you know, for him. You must address the most basic issues. And the use of the word experiment in his autobiography, for instance, uh, he reads, uh, you know, he reads about great scientists. He corresponds with important scientists. Uh, so he's by no means um, a nativist figure. He's by no means a figure who says that the East and everything that is non-modern is wonderful, and the West, which is at that point known for its scientific temperament, is problematic. And, and, uh, and also, like I mean, he's constantly writing to C.V. Raman. I mean, who are the great scientists of India at that point? It's C.V. Raman, J.C. Bose, and, and, and P.C. Ray. And these are three people that Gandhi is in constant correspondence about. And not, it's not about other things. They're talking, I mean, when he's in Calcutta, he's taken to J.C. Bose's laboratory. C.V. Raman takes him to his laboratory to show the kind of physical experiments that he's doing. So if Gandhi had no sensitivity to these kinds of questions, I don't think these three very great Indians would have bothered about him. I mean, it, the, the things that he objected to, of course, he didn't want vivisection. Vivisection. Mm -hmm. He did not think that animals should be killed for the cause of science, uh, even if it was to improve human uh, well-being. What about so industrialization? He had some objection to We had many objections to that, to that yes. Mm. Uh, but that is part of his criticism of capitalism, mm. basically. Uh, so it's, you know, in that sense, he shares a lot with the other critics of industrial capitalism, uh, 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 Ruskin, mm -hmm. but also Marx, mm -hmm. uh, though he doesn't cite Marx uh, very much, if at all. So he's part of his age in that sense as well. There's nothing kind of. Um, in this sense, uh, twee or peculiar or uh, you know purely indigenous about him. Uh, the, o the only, I mean, the only footnote that I would add to what you said is that he has a problem when technology or machines become the measure of human worth. That's really 
a philosophical problem that he has. You can't measure human worth by the objects that you possess or the objects that you create. And I think that's part of what Faisal said of, of, of the large critique of uh, modern industrial capitalism, which just begin, mm. begins to emerge from here. Mm. Would he have been on Twitter? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, 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 let, let me say this. Uh, um, Gandhi was, let's not forget that from 1903 to 1948, there is not one day that Gandhi does not own a newspaper. Mm. Yes. Own a newspaper and a printing press. So he is somebody who is on top of print technology of that time. Uh, he uses all means of communication, including a telephone. One of the first persons to own a telephone uh, in Johannesburg was M.K. Gandhi Barrett Law. Mm. Uh, he doesn't have a problem with the telephone. Uh, they have a teleprinter. Uh, ashram had its own post office. So all means of communication were available to him. Would he use Twitter? I don't know. Uh, I think it's a very abusive medium, and he would have problems with uh, the abuse that, uh, that happens. Because with communication comes responsibility, and I think uh, he would have things to say about the lack of responsibility that some of these things allow. And two, Twitter is ungrammatical. Gandhi, um, you know, uh, Gandhi liked grammar, uh, uh, so I don't know. Um, uh, uh, but yes, right. other things, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Another, I think there was a gentleman over here who had a question. Sorry, what, last question, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, interested in how Gandhi arrived at his way of resolving problems. Um, specifically thinking of the salt march you were saying uh, and also the Ahmedabad mill worker strike. He conducted some surveys and although you use this wonderful term about uh, getting irrefutable data, I'm not quite sure how irrefutable, how scientific that was. And he also, the iconic solution that Gandhi came up that he's known around the world for is fasting. In the case of the Ahmedabad mill worker strike, he was on both sides, the workers and as uh, a recipient of uh, financial support from the Sarabai family, who's also on the, had to support the Milones. Fasting at that time had been in place, uh, used by the suffragettes yeah. around the world. And I'm just wondering if the techniques of problem solving he arrived at were something that was objective, structured, or was it just something he stumbled upon? Well, I. Um you know, um, interesting that you should mention the suffragette because Gandhi is deeply interested in the movement. He actually, uh, both uh, on his both long stays in London, uh, both in 19, 1906 and 1909, he spent a lot of time understanding the movement, meeting the leaders, attending its meetings, and he was aware of the method of fasting as also uh, the method of breaking window pens. And that's when he begins to say, what we are doing is not what they're doing. So he knows the difference between what Satyagra in South Africa seeks to do and what the movement here was. So therefore, he gives up the word passive resistance completely, saying, no, that's not passive resistance. What we're doing is Satyagra. Uh, on the question of fasting, I think uh, uh, the particular fast that you mentioned is a salid fast. Right? Uh, it is an act of coercion, and he, he does reflect upon on that act much later and says, uh, I do not think that that fast was unsullied, and therefore it actually amounted to coercion, both of the mill workers as also of the mill owners. Uh, among the various public fasts that he has, and we're talking only of the public fast, he said oh, there's only one fast that is the pure fast which is the 1933 fast that he does for self-purification. All other acts of fasting, he felt, were sullied in some way or the other because they involved a party other than himself. Uh, and when it involves a party other than yourself, it begins to exercise coercion or a moral pressure. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think Gandhi knows that one has to distinguish between two modes of fasting, one which really brings you closer to God because the word upavas actually means to dwell closer to God, and an act of fasting which is bodily mortification. 
So the Ahmedabad fast, as also a lot of the other fasts, would amount to bodily mortification and not necessarily things that bring you closer to God. Uh, but it's, it's, he's drawing uh, things from all around, uh, but then fashioning them in his own way. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the data, uh, see Gandhi, um, Gandhi does not believe in sample surveys. And I think that's the good thing about it. You get very close data if you do full surveys. I mean, you don't do sample surveys. So although statistically uh, uh, provable they might be, uh, these are complete household surveys which are done. Uh, and I've, we only have the questionnaire. We don't have the data sheets. Uh, but it's a 27-page questionnaire. Uh, uh, very exhaustive, including among the BDs that you smoke. I mean, he, you know, he wanted to know all kinds of things. Uh, so uh, that happens. Uh, and it happens because you go to each person, to their house, uh, don't. So it's, it's a fascinating thing. I think we're probably going to, unfortunately, going to have to leave it there. I'm just going to ask both of you to sum up in just in 30 seconds, because I know they're going to get us out of the room. Um, where does Gandhi stand today in modern India and perhaps in, in the West too? Faisal? Well, uh, that's a small question. <laughs> I would say that, you know, it's um, India today and in the world where Gandhi is being attacked, actually, by all kinds of people. Even in the mode of attack, he remains indispensable. You can't do without him. So even those who dislike Gandhi can only conduct their campaigns in Gandhian ways, not non-violently necessarily, but by a kind of almost uh, perverse deployment of Gandhian imagery and Gandhian styles. Uh, and those uh, who criticize him from outside are forced to adopt what they themselves criticize about him, a moralistic attitude. You know, why would, you know, what you were saying about Manu Gandhi and, you know, why would it affect people so much? if they were not entirely moralistic uh, about it. So he's a very curious uh, figure because he can draw his enemies in. His enemies are much more interested in Gandhi than his friends are. Exactly. <laughs> the friends don't really say very much. And this is the power of the man, you know, that he could, uh, uh, he could transform even his enemies, though not necessarily into nonviolent warriors. Yeah. Anything else? I, I think um, Faisal uh, answered it in a very large way, but I will say this only. India has a curious relationship with him, has always had it. In good times, don't invite Gandhi. He's a party popper, mm -hmm. breaks a good party. Bad times, he's the only ally that you have. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the, the, the changing fortunes of Gandhi depends on our understanding of whether we are going through good times or bad times. In good times, we don't need him. Yeah. He raises far too many questions of the moral kind, creates guilt. Mm -hmm. Bad times. There is no body like him who, to go to and hold hands. On that note, thank you so much for coming this morning. Thank you very much for speaking.